I'm Mike McFadden, the president of AGU's Ocean Sciences section, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's Sverdrup Lecture. The uh, lectureship is awarded typically once a year to an individual whose research is characterized by the highest standards of excellence and originality, whose contributions are a broad relevance to the field, and who can communicate the excitement of current trends in research to a wide audience. Such a person is Bill Jenkins, this year's awardee. Bill received his PhD in physics from McMaster University uh, in Hamilton, Ontario in 1974. After that, he went to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution where he's been almost ever since, uh, except for a four-year stint between 1998 and early this year when he took a professorship at the Southampton Oceanography Center in the UK. In the same way that Harold Sverdrup pioneered our understanding of the general circulation, and the science of oceanography as an interdisciplinary endeavor, so too has Bill Jenkins made contrib pioneering contributions to our view of ocean physics, biology, and chemistry through the development of tracer techniques and their application to a wide range of fundamental problems in oceanography. One measure of the significance of Bill's work is the number of awards and accolades that he's received over the years. Among these are Fellow of the American Geophysical Union, Fellow of the Geochemical Society and European Association of Geochemistry, the Rosen Steele Award in Oceanographic Science from the University of Miami, the A.G. Huntsman Medal from Bedford Institute of Oceanography, the Van Allen Clark Chair for Excellence in Oceanography from Woods Hole, and the Henry Bryant Bigelow Medal in Oceanography also from Woods Hole. So we're very pleased and honored that Bill has agreed to give this year's Sergeant Lecture. And in recognition of this, I'd like to present him a certificate from the Ocean Sciences section, which reads, uh, American Geophysical Union Ocean Sciences section recognizes William Jenkins for the 2002 Harold Sverdrup Lecture, the title, What Oceanographers Are Learning from Transient Tracers. Bill? I'm uh, speechless. I think I'm uh, very uh, honored to have been given this uh, this award, uh, particularly in the uh, 100th anniversary of uh, Scripps uh, Institution. And I think this is uh, very, very nice, I think. Um, I'd like to say that I'm accepting this award and um, giving this lecture not as an individual, but as a perhaps an unelected representative of a community of um, tracer geochemists who uh, make some very, very difficult measurements and somehow try to learn something interesting about how the oceans work. Thank you very much. Uh, what I'd like to try to do in the next uh, a little bit of time is trying to convince you that uh, transient tracers are telling, telling us something rather interesting about uh, how the oceans work. Now there may be some among you that may feel that this particular slide is prophetic. Um, and I'd like to try to change your mind in some sense. The, uh, the structure of my talk is that I'm going to try to set the stage with a brief introduction and a rationale and explanation of, of why we bother with these measurements and to give you two particular examples of what we're learning about how the ocean works. The first one is learning about ventilation and circulation. And I'll try to give you just a few examples of how that, uh, how that comes about. And the second part, or third part, is quantifying biogeochemical cycles. And I think this is going to be my revenge on the community in some sense, is I'm going to leave you with a little bit of a puzzle. At least it's a puzzle for me, I'm a bear of very little brain, um, about what I think is actually a paradox. And I would sort of cast this out in the hopes that perhaps somebody will come up and explain it to me or come up with a solution to this little, little problem. Anyway, um, everybody realizes that uh, 
carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are increasing and of course this is linked with global change and we know that in principle the temperature is increasing over the globe as a response to the changes in the radiative forcing in the, the atmosphere. Um, my particular interest as well is the fact that we're also altering biogeochemical cycles, elemental cycles in the ocean, for instance, nitro nitrogen and, and phosphorus, on a very substantial way with our activities. So in addition to the changes in climate forcing, which are going to change the biogeochemical state of the ocean, there's a change in elemental cycles which will drive this as well. So it's particularly important in some sense to understand how these system works in order to make predictions about how they will respond in, in terms of changes in forcing. And of course on a shorter time scale we also have climate drivers such as ENSO and, and all the other uh, climate modes that people talk about and this of course introduces changes in our weather patterns which are of societal importance. Now foreknowledge is power and in some senses we need this foreknowledge for policy creation and mitigation of these events, how to deal with these changes if and when they need to be deal dealt with. But simple intuition about these processes is not enough anymore. We're dealing with a complex system and we need to have a complicated model in some respects to make these kind of predictions. Now the difficulty of course is that these models require process identification. Uh, we're dealing with a system in which processes are occurring on spatial scales ranging over nearly 10 orders of magnitude and time scales of comparable scale. And we have to leave something out because within the available resources, within the available computing power that we have, there's no way we can include everything. So we need to know what these processes are. We need process identification. We need to parameterize those processes which are not explicitly included in the, in the models and on the subgrid scale kind of uh, situation. And we need to validate or test the models. Now some people argue that model validation is an oxymoron, but the argument basically is that you have to find which models are best matching reality and try to find out where they're going wrong if they don't. So in some senses that's where tracers may come in. Now as a brief explanation to those who may not be familiar, tracers are traced. They're in very low quantities, uh, very low concentrations and by nature fairly difficult to measure. And in some senses they are passive travelers if you will. And that is a trace and follow the flows in the system. And that flow may be water flow, it also may be material flow as well. For instance, uh, the carbon flux associated with part particulate material falling from the surface of the ocean. Um, and they're tricky. And the reason why I say they're tricky is because generically they're undersampled. We, because they're difficult to measure, because um, there's a, an enormous amount of cost involved in these kind of measurements, they're generally not well sampled. And often they're not well understood because we don't know the true behavior of some of these properties in the ocean. So uh, there are challenges associated with that. And when you look at a distribution of properties or tracers, you, they're affected by a multitude of, of um, processes and disentangling those processes can be a fundamental challenge. Now the, the first thing that you're familiar with of course is steady state tracers. These, these are properties that have been measured since the earliest days of oceanography. Uh, they're still routinely measured in the oceans and we have consequently very large data sets. Uh, they've been used to visualize water masses, the existence of large bodies of water that have comparable characteristics and their flow patterns. And of course a good example of this is the distribution of salinity down the center of the North Atlantic and you have essentially a tracer which is responding to patterns in E minus P and you find low salinity water propagating northward from areas of high precipitation, salty water from the Mediterranean outflow and in fact a hint of, of deep water convection and movement in and along the North Atlantic. Another example of this tracer, a steady state tracer, is oxygen, which is now overprinted with a biological signature, consumption in the deep water associated with oxidation of particulate material, uh, but also comparable features associated with these fluid pathways in motion. And in particular, you find this very classic example of highly oxygenated water associated with North Atlantic deep water formation. This, of course, is related to the meridian, meridian, I can hardly say this, the meridional overturning circulation. That sort of large scale 
thermohaline circulation in the oceans, which is associated with the redistribution of heat in the oceans. And this overturning circulation is important both from the viewpoint of, of redistributing the heat around the globe, but also from the viewpoint of carrying things like carbon dioxide in the system. So this particular overturning cell will actually take up carbon dioxide in the northern regions where you have uh, cold water being uh, cooled and also sinks it into the deep water of the world oceans. And of course the argument is that man-made fossil fuels will be taken up by this very same process in some sense. So we need to understand this mechanism and we need to have a handle on those rates. And of course don't forget that we also have the biological pump which can in fact short circuit the carbon flux through the system, uh, moving material vertically um, in a very short period of time and carrying other things with that. Now the thing about these steady state tracers is that with the exception of something like radiocarbon, they don't tell you anything about the rate information in the system. And you can argue that if you look at the advection diffusion equation for these materials, the fact that that DCDT is zero would suggest that it's going to be very difficult to disentangle the, the physical processes associated with redistribution and the biogeochemical source sink terms in the system. So it becomes problematic in terms of extracting that kind of information. And there we'd like to lead into something like transient tracers. And what I mean, of course, by transient tracers are those properties or tracers that are distributed perhaps on the global scale that are changing in time. And they're largely, in fact, totally anthropogenic, uh, produced by mankind's activities. And you can actually break them down into two generic kinds of tracers. Ones that have been produced by nuclear atmospheric weapons testing, in the 50s and 60s, things like tritium, which is the heaviest isotope of hydrogen, and radiocarbon, and those that are produced by humankind's activities subsequently, like the CFCs from refrigerants and at one point in time, spray can propellants, and you can imagine things like CO2. Now, I'm, I apologize to those geochemists that have dealt with other tracers like iodine-129, cesium-137, strontium-90, and so on, but those particular tracers I find are very, very useful for tracing the pathways through the biogeochemical system and I think I just don't have time to really talk about them, but they're actually equally important in terms of understanding these processes. These are the simple ones that I as a physicist can maybe have some hope of understanding. So we also recognize they're changing with time and they're either increased, increasing monotonically with time or they're spiked in information. And because of this rate of change, you actually have a chance of getting this rate information. And the argument is that now DCDT is no longer zero. And you can somehow play that term off against these physical terms. And I parenthesize the J or the source sink term because in general, these tracers don't have significant or have very weak source sink terms. So the argument is that you can actually learn something about the physical processes in the system and try to understand them. Now an example of this is tritium which is produced by the, the atmospheric weapon tests in the 50s and 60s and as an isotope of hydrogen is traveling with a water molecule and it actually produces spike-like injection into the North Atlantic for example and you find a characteristic pattern of, of penetration of this isotope into the circulation system. Now what's interesting about that, you probably can't see this on the scale, but after the major insult or injection of tritium into the environment, subsequently in the 70s, the predominant injection of tritium into the system was actually as a result of the holdup of tritium in the Arctic freshwater system and its leakage into the North Atlantic through that system. So it's now a dye tracer, if you will, of an important process from the viewpoint of the hydrologic balance of the North Atlantic. So you have that kind of attribute to the distribution. You also find that this is penetrating, if you take a section down the North Atlantic, it's penetrating into this overturning circulation. And you have this front of tritium now highlighting or dyeing the, uh, the overturning circulation cell that we were talking about. So you have this imaginary front, if you will, penetrating into the circulation, which gives you the time rate of, turn of, of, of the penetration. Now the key point behind this is that one realization of this distribution is not really enough because there's a multitude of pathways whereby the tritium could have arrived at this particular point in space. But the key is that if you can actually develop time series of that penetration and take different snapshots, you're going to actually get a much better idea of how the system is working. And if the circulation system is changing in time, 
as we well know it is now, you can actually track the changes in the circulation as well. You can actually see this. This is a time series at Bermuda, and what you find is that you see this penetration, first at intermediate depths in the, the mid-70s, and much deeper down in the late 80s. So you can actually see this blanket moving with time um, through the system. And in fact, what's really quite nice about this is you actually see the downwelling of this tritium spike into the thermocline at a rate of about 10 to 20 meters per year. So there's a clear visualization in some sense of the penetration of this, this dye in, into the system. Well, what I'd like to leave with you in terms of the, the concept of, of these transient tracers is that they do illuminate pathways of ventilation. And I will explain what I mean by ventilation because that's actually a geochemist invented term, I think. Um, but their distributions resemble one another to a first order. So that if you were to look at that distribution of, of CFCs, for example, in the North Atlantic, you'd see a very similar picture. And, and the analogy I'd like to give you is, is that, in fact, it's a bit like viewing a scene through a color filter. By viewing the scene through that color filter, you, you actually generally see the shapes of the, thing, the objects in that scene quite, quite handily, and you gain a lot of information. But it's actually when you start to put the other color filters in, you find a richness of detail in that scene, and you actually get the bulk of the information. And that richness of detail is, is actually depending upon the history of the boundary conditions of the tracer. So you have an input function, which is a spike here, which is predominantly northern hemisphere, in fact, in its injection. And you have radiocarbon, which is less of a spike. You have CFCs, which are ramping up. All of these tell you something different about how the, the tracer is coupling to the system and how the system is working. And it's those differences which will provide you with the information in the end. OK, well, I promised a couple of examples. Um, the first one is, is learning about ventilation and circulation. So what I'd like to try to do, first of all, is try to explain to you what I mean by ventilation. Okay, it's a bit of a nebulous term, but the, the, the best definition I can come up with is it's a transference of surface-derived characteristics to the deep water of the oceans. And what I mean by that might be oxygenation, because of course the, the oceans are undersaturated in oxygen due to uh, respiration, bacterial respiration, and when they reach the surface you take up more oxygen. It could be nutrient removal at the surface, it could be CFC invasion, radiocarbon uptake, all of these processes imprint themselves on, on the waters that are moving down the circulation cell, and that's what I mean by ventilation. Now the key thing to keep in mind is that it's dependent in some sense on the nature of the forcing. And I'll give you a good example. Nutrients and the surface water are taken up on time scales of a, of a few days, uh, whereas gas exchange oxygenation or uptake of, of, uh, of, of CFCs takes place on time scales of a month, and uptake of CO2 or, or disengagement of CO2 takes place because of the, 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 the uh, carbonate system buffering on time scales of a year, and radiocarbon, because it's an isotope tracer, takes something like a decade to equilibrate. So all of these tracers are connected to the surface ocean and ventilated in important different ways. And that's actually an important constraint in terms of trying to tie together things like model performance in, uh, in terms of ventilation. Now, I would like to think that there's three overlapping and not unrelated techniques that you can use these tracers for in terms of understanding something about circulation. One of them is flow visualization. Another is comparison of models in some kind of uh, statistical way. And a third is diagnostic calculations. And I'd like to give a couple of examples of these. Now, one of them, and I do apologize, this is probably not visible to the back of the room, but this is a spectacular view of the invasion of CFCs into the bottom waters of the world ocean around the Antarctic continent. And you can't really see these numbers, but the high values in the Waddell Sea moving northward into the, into the bottom waters of the North Atlantic and the Argentine Basin. From the Ross Sea over here, you also see plumes of these CFCs moving in. This is work that Orsi and, and Johnson Bullister and, and Raina Fine and other people have been doing in this region. But you see this dye sweeping into the system. And these are bottom water formation processes that you can see immediately. Now, here's, a, here's an example of differences now. This is radiocarbon. And this is a view now, it's a different projection, I apologize, but this is a view in the Pacific of the penetration of radiocarbon. Now I'm cheating a little bit because radiocarbon is both a, a natural steady state tracer, uh, natural radiocarbon, and now bomb influence as well. So at the front end of this thing, you're actually going to see the influence of bomb 
uh, radiocarbon coming into the system as well. But it shows you a rather different view of this thing on different time scales and associated with different sort of connection with the atmosphere in some sense. So these things will give you information that is unique and independent, similar to a first approximation, but independent in terms of model evaluation. And that's really the take home point, I think, from that, that kind of comparison. Now these pathways, of course, are the pathways where you get propagation of climate anomalies and CO2 into the system. And in a shallower region, things like ENSO, you can learn something as well. So this is sort of a second example. Now, everybody is well aware of the impact of ENSO on the climate of the U.S. and, and uh, its relationship to global climate. Um, the key point is that you have this multi-year periodicity, but there is also a longer time scale kind of connection as well. And if you look at the power spectral analysis of the Southern Oscillation Index, you find a significant power at the decade time scales, and in fact, the sort of 10 to 15 year time scales. Now, it's difficult for me at least to see how you can get that kind of memory, if you will, in the system from purely atmospheric processes, and that the ocean, in some sense, must be a longer term integrator of that process in some way. And of course, this is something that Gu and Flander had argued may be regulated by interregional subsurface exchange of water in the system. And Gu and Flander's model, if you will, published in the late 90s, um, is that you have um, a counterpoint process here, a divergence, Ekman divergence of surface waters in the tropics, which draws upwelling up in the system, and convergence in the, in the subtropics, which produces subduction or forcing water down. And this overturning Hadley cell, if you will, is actually a conveyor that can, in principle, carry un climate anomalies, temperature anomalies in the system. And so you'd argue, in some sense, that you have this kind of combination of circulation cells in the system where you have a thermal anomaly in the system exchanging at the equatorial region where N-cell events are, are triggered in some sense, being swept into the circulation, subducted through this loop, and carried back up. So there's a long-term memory effect in some sense. And Gu and Flander's simple model actually suggests that this may well be a viable explanation for this process. Now there is evidence that this process has changed in time. This is a wonderful uh, radiocarbon, I can hardly say this, radiocarbon, uh, coral radiocarbon record from a Galapagos coral, which is seasonally resolving, which shows the imprint, first of all, in the long time scales of the influx of bomb radiocarbon into the system. But superimposed on that trend is, first of all, the ENSO events, La Nina, El Nino events that are going on in the system, but a change, an abrupt change in the late 70s associated with what may be the circulation pattern, the plumbing in the system. So in some sense, you might argue that a long-term modulation of ENSO events might be driven by changes in this, this plumbing system over here. The key question then becomes, how do we get a handle on those sort of time scales? Well, here, tracers, I think, can provide you with a, a valuable insight. Now, this is a picture of tritium uh, taken from the Wos expeditions in the early 90s. Uh, down the center of the Pacific, this is the north and this is the south, and you see this plume of tritium. This is nothing new, by the way. This is something that Raina Fine and, and Mike McFadden, in fact, had been commenting on in the early 80s or mid-80s about the evidence from the GSX data of, of a tritium plume at the equatorial region. And they concluded, right, rightfully so, that this is an overturning cell. And you can actually see this pattern not just in tritium. I'm doing tritium because that's what I measure, but you can see it in CFCs, you can see it in radiocarbon. There are differences in the pattern again, which tell you something. But the reason why I'm plugging tritium for this is that, in fact, there's another piece of information that you can get from the system. Whoops. Uh, what it boils down to is that tritium, it's a radioactive isotope, decays to helium-3. And there's actually a, a, another pattern of helium-3, uh, another isotope here in the system, which is uh, following this kind of trend of injection of, of this uh, subsurface water. But the thing about helium-3, which is a stable inert gas, so in fact it hasn't got any sort of chemistry or biology, is that you can, in principle, use it as a way, of a, as a dating tool in some sense. The concept is really very simple. What you have is a little parcel of water sitting at the sea surface, which has tritium in it, which is decaying helium-3. But because it's in contact with the atmosphere, the helium-3 is being lost. So in principle, this water leaves the surface, once it sinks, with no excess helium-3. 
After some period of time, of course, the, the tritium is still decaying and the helium-3 cannot escape, so it's building up. So the argument, quite in some sense, is that by measuring the amount of excess helium-3 in this parcel of water, you can actually measure the time that's elapsed since this parcel was at the sea surface, and in principle at some other location, the time elapsed since it's moved. And so in principle, at least, you could actually get a measure of, of flow rates from this and ventilation rates. The tricky part about it, this is that, in fact, tritium helium age responds nonlinear to mixing, but on, in some sense, it does have a sensitivity to time scales ranging from a few months to a couple of decades. So in principle, it's, it's a handy kind of tracer or age dating tool for this. So here's the point. I'm trying to say that the tritium tells you the pathway that this ventilation takes place. It traces out this overturning cell in the Pacific. Combining it with helium-3 can give you some kind of measure of the age. So here's this age property here. It might be better to look at this rather than in depth space, but against potential density. The argument is that the water moves along surfaces of constant density more readily. And you find this plume of tritium moving toward the equatorial regions and actually changing its density in some sense. But that there's a, a, an influx of tritium along this density range of something like 24 to 26 or 26.5 kilograms per meter cube. And of course, there's this cons consequence helium-3 plume as well. You get this impression, by the way, of this helium-3 kind of trying to burst out of the surface. And you can actually see this excess helium-3 in the mixed layer of the tropics. And you can actually, knowing the gas exchange rates, get a constraint on the total amount of upwelling in, in the tropics as well. But if you calculate the age and picture yourself sliding in from the subtropics in here, you find the age increases linearly and in fact increases to a value of something like about 10 to 15 years. So it's exactly the right time scales in some sense or a good match to the kind of fluctuations that you see in ENSO variability. Now that's a circumstantial argument, and in fact there's another problem with this, of course, that water doesn't move around in little boxes, does it? And when you actually construct the effective diffusion equation, oh, we've got a PowerPoint surprise here, I'm sorry to say. Uh, those little squares should be scalar products. Um, but what you have is an invection diffusion equation for the age, which we call tau in this instance. And you have a series of nonlinear terms over here which can confuse the problem. What it really means in some sense is that there are processes which can distort the distribution of the age in some sense. But these are actually observable quantities. You can measure the gradients in them and there's a way of getting a handle on them. We won't deal with that at the moment, but simply suffice it to say that the information appears to be there and that within the context of an appropriate model for the exchange between these basins, I would argue that the information will be there, both in the tritium helium age, CFC ages, concentrations of these tracers. I think once they get put together in these kind of model calculations, we'll provide quantitative constraints on that process. But in some sort of circumstantial sense, um, the age patterns are consistent with that. Now, of course, there's always the argument that what you really need to do is set up your global circulation model and evaluate or compare it with tracers. And this is, this is the other sort of exercise you can do with transient tracers. Now, what I should have done, I hope you can't read these little, little black strips up here. It's a bit like having the black strips over the eyes in those naughty pictures I used to have. Uh, I don't want you to know whose models those are. It's not relevant. All I want you to realize is that this is... Uh, an idealized section taken out of models roughly from the Ross Sea going northward to the equator in the South Pacific and it's a prediction of what these models will have for CFC concentrations in the water. And the take home point from this is they're all different. These are all legitimate, valid ocean circulation models. Well, if you talk to the protagonists, they may not agree with the competitions, but they, these are all credible ocean models and they all have different predictions for the tracer distribution. Now that tells you something because the actual observations over here, which are kind of smudged because there's dots where the samples are, um, the actual observations provide a valid constraint, not only for which model is doing better, but where the models are doing poorly. And so what I'd like to say is that kind of information will be the grist for the mills of the models in the future in terms of evaluating them. Uh, so you really have a challenge in some sense. This is, um, this is a, a, a map of CFC inventories in the ocean at a particular point in time provided by Rain and Fine and John Bullister. And you can actually see a very compelling story of where the stuff is going in. 
So in a very qualitative sense, you can immediately say, this is where the CO2 is being taken up by the oceans, other complicated issues aside. Uh, but the key point is that any credible model of ocean circulation that's going to handle the carbon system, that's going to handle the transport of heat and, and CO2, has got to do it right by the tracers as well. And the CFCs in this particular case are a very compelling kind of set of observations. But it's not just CFCs. As I said before, you're looking at the scene through a one color filter, you ought to look at the other tracers as well. And the more different those tracers are, the harder it's going to be to fake it. And you don't want the models to fake it because if they're getting the right answer for the wrong reasons, you're not going to have any confidence in, in uh, their predictions as well. So the take home lesson in this in some sense is that there is a lot of grist for this kind of comparison. Now, the final point in terms of looking at uh, circulation and ventilation is, is a diagnostic calculation. And simply what I mean by a diagnostic calculation is looking at a tracer distribution directly and with some simple kind of concept model of the circulation, be it advection, diffusion, or geostrophy, try to get some handle on what the scale of the processes are involved in that. Now, one example is, is um, taken from the North Atlantic where we had an experiment in the 90s called the subduction experiment. This is just off the coast of, uh, of Africa and, and south of uh, Portugal where we had a large area that was instrumented with moorings and uh, hydrographic sampling. And what we were able to do with the sampling was to measure the tritium helium age. And these are a couple of surfaces. Um, this is 26.5 uh, kilograms per meter cubed, which actually outcrops in the winter time in this region. What you find is that the age is somewhat below one year old. Um, and you can actually see as you sweep down this, iso this isopycnal surface, the age gets older and of course that's a, a natural result of circulation and to some extent some kind of mixing. A deeper surface has different characteristics but they're consistent with what we know about circulation. But what you can do is you can take a combination of pieces of information. One of them is to take geostrophic uh, calculations take the, the, the complete advection diffusion equation for tritium helium and the salinity advection diffusion equation, and you can actually extract some useful information. The argument basically is this, that geostrophy gives you the relative velocity profile. It gives you the shear. It doesn't give you the reference level of velocity. You don't know that from geostrophy. But when you put the age equation in there, you actually can pull out that reference level of velocity, and that's the key point. Then if you combine it with something like salinity, you can actually get the complete set of information about mixing rates and advection in the system. And as an example of that, we've calculated from this, this data over here, the absolute velocities as a function of depths. And so this is 162 decibar going down to 540 decibars. And you get this beautiful beta spiral as you go down through the system. And the error bars on this are a millimeter per second. So you've actually got a very rock solid estimate of, of circulation rates in the system. So this is one example of how you can do, use these traces, not in abstract, not by themselves, but in combination with sensible physics. Okay? Now, you can also take this information, once you know that, and you can actually calculate horizontal mixing rates, something of the order of about 1,000 meters squared per second, which is entirely consistent with the, the purposeful tracer release experiments, for example. And you can actually calculate vertical velocities. And the open circles here are the tracer estimates of vertical velocities ranging from close to zero meters per year up to about 25 or 30 meters per year. Um, these Stars here with the large error bars are actually from isothermally following floats. And the error bars are a bit larger because they only had a dozen floats and we happen to have about 10 to the 31, although we had trouble keeping track of which one is which, but at least we have a lot more floats. Um, and the curve here is a spherical balance. So it's entirely consistent, which is not particularly surprising. Uh, that vertical velocity, of course, is what you see at Bermuda different location, but you actually see this downwelling at the rate of about 20 meters per year, 25 meters per year. So these tracers give it to you right away. Now, like they say in the late, late night TV commercials, weight does more. Um, you can actually take the advection diffusion equation for oxygen, and because now you sorted out the, uh, the, the physical redistribution terms in the equation, you can actually get a handle on the consumption rates as well. And there you go. You get a nice, beautiful exponential curve, 
really given by the oxygen infection diffusion equation. You have to, it's actually a bit tricky because mixing is rather important for oxygen in this particular region. But once you take that into account, you get a beautiful relationship which actually fits an exponential. I'm not sure why an exponential would be appropriate, but it feels right in some sense. Now we're getting into religion in some ways. But what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about quantifying biogeochemical cycles. And those oxygen utilization rates, in fact, are an entry into that particular process. What we have here on the right-hand side is the oxygen utilization rate determined from the subduction region. And you also have one that's been determined by a variety of techniques, actually, um, in the Sargasso Sea region. Now, what you can do is you can integrate that oxygen demand. Because what is that oxygen demand a result of? It's actually oxidation of falling particulate material plus possibly DOC in the water. And it's really related to this fact that you have this downflux of carbon through the system due to photosynthetic fixation of carbon and, and loss of the system. And knowing the Redfield quotient, that is to say the ratio of oxygen to carbon, you can actually calculate. That should be a minus sign in front of that. Um, you can actually calculate the integrated oxygen demand and then the integrated carbon flux that's entering the system. And that, just to pick the number, is something between three and four moles of carbon per meter squared per year, which I have to admit got me in trouble with a lot of biological oceanographers because they didn't like that number. It was far, far too large. But that's the way it is. There's an agreement between a variety of methods, all right? You have tritium helium dating. It turns out you look at tritium invasion models, long-term models of the simple models of the invasion of this isotope into the thermocline. Um, you can I'll maybe mention seasonal oxygen amplitude as well. But uh, all of these different techniques give consistent results. So I'm very confident in some sense that um, this number is, can stand. Now there's another one. The other side of the photosynthetic coin is oxygen production. So if you go into the euphotic zone, you find a rather interesting thing. This is a 10-year composite annual cycle from Bermuda, from the bat station. And what you find is every summertime, build up, subsurface build up of oxygen in the seasonal thermocline. And the argument has been, and it's been demonstrated by looking at, at um, dissolved gas dynamics, if you will, that this oxygen buildup is due to photosynthesis. Right? Now, it's a bit of an awkward thing to do because this is an open system. You have gas exchange in the system. But if you use very sensible models like the price or pinkle model and run your evolutions through the system, you can actually come up with an estimate of oxygen production from the system. Uh, you get this beautiful summer buildup, but there's also this very nice counterpoint decrease below, which also tells you that it has to be biological, that this decrease in oxygen below is the result of the rain down of this carbon and its remineralization. So you have this nice signal, but it's there as well in carbon, because of course you have the carbon drawdown. You'll notice this kind of drawdown of carbon roughly in the same season, and you'll notice a difference in the character of those those isoplasts, if you will. And the reason why there's a difference is because carbon has a one year, sort of typical order one year exchange time scale, whereas oxygen has something like about a month. So carbon has got a very different gas exchange thing. And the interesting thing about it is they give the same results, which says if we messed up with the gas exchange problem, they shouldn't give the same result. So it does suggest that we're on the right track. You also see this deeper cycle. It's not quite so obvious down here, but it really is there if you do the contouring right. And a third one, which is looking at carbon isotope budgets as well, because it turns out that this fixation of carbon is isotopically fractionating. And you can actually do a separate mass budget. And this is just a, uh, a very nice paper by, by Nikki Gruber, um, which talks about the carbon isotope signature. And you can set up the mass balance, and you actually can do a mass balance calculation. Now, depending on how you put this all together, you get something of it. Oh, what a surprise, between three and four moles per meter squared per year. Now, one final one. I'm sorry I'm dwelling into the geochemistry and part of the physicist, so you just have to bear with me. But there's actually some meat in this, so hang on. Um, Another one is a helium-3 flux gauge. Helium-3 is a transient tracer because it's produced by the decay of tritium. And if you look at a time series at Bermuda, and the, we're looking at the isotopic ratio, you find that the isotopic ratio of the dissolved helium is consistently above solu solubility equilibrium. Now, the error bars are significant. 
but the mean is very significant, okay? And this means a supersaturation of helium-3. Now, if any gas is supersaturated in the mixed layer, it's got to be leaving the system, right? There's a flux involved. And that flux can be calculated using sort of documented air-sea gas exchange rates, which are probably uncertain to probably 25% or 30%, but nonetheless, they're there. And you can actually calculate an implied flux of helium-3 leaving the ocean surface as a function of time. And it's positive, as you'd expect, because there's a supersaturation. Okay, who would be interested in that aside from geochemists, and where is it coming from? Uh, well, where is it coming from is interesting, because if you say, well, it's the decay of tritium in the euphotic zone in the mixed layer. Well, it turns out it's an order of magnitude too large. So where is it coming from? Well, you just have to look below. You find this is a time series of helium-3 in the thermocline at about 500 meters. You have this nice beefy maximum of helium-3. That helium-3 is there because it's been accumulating as a result of the decay of tritium in the thermocline. All right? So the argument would be that 10% of this flux is coming from the mixed layer, euphotic zone, and the rest has to be coming up from below. Well, does this make sense? Well, we actually have documentation of the inventories of helium-3 and tritium, and if you add them together, you can use a tracer called Zeta, and you find that that is decreasing at a rate, and if you look at the rate of decrease of that inventory, that comes up to something like about these lovely geochemical units, about 2% meter per day. All right, sorry about the units, but they'll go away. Just think of it as opera. Now, here's where it gets interesting. That maximum just looks like nitrate or phosphate. There's a maximum of nitrate and phosphate in the thermocline for different reasons. Well, sort of similar in the sense that they're both old water, but they're different, okay? So my argument is, if the helium-3 is moving up through the thermocline and into the mixed layer to outgas, it's got to be physical processes, unless somebody knows of some zooplankton that's using helium-3 for flotation. Um, so we're going to correlate the two. And in fact, you find there, there's a lovely correlation uh, through the thermocline. There's a waterfall down, the, down at the bottom here, which is right near the surface, because of course those tracers don't have identical characteristics. Nitrate can be taken up as soon as the lights go on. Helium-3 has to get to the surface and out gas. So there is a difference, but in terms of the net relationship, there is this quite definable slope. So being a physicist and not being very bright, you just correlate the two and say that the flux of nitrate is equal to this slope times the flux of helium-3. So you're using helium-3 like a flux gauge. Right? And when you do that, you get something which is equivalent for a new production of something like four moles of carbon per meter squared per year. Right? Similar numbers. So what I like to do, what I'm trying to do is to give you a religious feeling in your heart about these numbers, okay? Say, I believe, all right? Uh, in fact, what we have are th three different measurements in some sense. What we have in some sense is the euphotic zone budget, the second thing we talked about. Uh, you have oxygen mass balances, you have carbon mass balances, you have carbon isotope balances. These all give you something called net community production, okay? The euphotic zone thing that we first talked about is the oxygen utilization rate integrated as a function of depth. That's export production. That's the flux of carbon into the system from above. And the flux gauge that I talked about is new production. That's the, the rate of new nitrate or phosphate. It doesn't matter whether we do this calculation with nitrate or phosphate. It really doesn't. The slopes give the same answer, okay, to within the Redfield ratio or the slight difference in Redfield ratio that people have seen. Um, so they are different in some sense, but on an annual average, they have to be the same because the carbon has to be conserved. So they are the same measurement on an annual average. And they do agree within errors, okay? So what we have, oh, there is a little bit of a difference. This is still within errors, but this thermocline balance, of course, is not really a local measure. All of these here are local to Bermuda in some sense, a Sargasso Sea typical central oligotrophic ocean. Uh, this one is more of a gyre-wide average, so you can probably expect it to be a little bit different. So what we have is three methods. 
They have internal redundancy. For instance, the euphotic zone uses two, two different um, elements and, and an isotopic system. The other one has um, tracer age dating versus uh, geostrophy and so on. You have rather different techniques giving you three independent estimates and they're giving you the same numbers. Right. Now, any self-respecting geochemist would then quietly retire. All right? Now, this is the problem. Let's think about the nature of the, the nutrient fluxes. The transport mechanism has to be physical. Unless you know of something that's going to have an acquired taste for helium-3, um, it's got to carry them in source proportions. It's a, it's a, it's a, a Reynolds flux, right? It's got to be mass transport, which doesn't discriminate between the tracers that it's carrying, okay? So in addition to carrying helium-3 and nutrients, it's got to carry oxygen and carbon and heat in the source characteristics, all right? And it, can't, it has to occur in addition to nitrogen fixation, right? Because nitrogen fixation is a parallel process. So those estimates that I've got more or less uh, for the helium-3 flux gauge are, 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 are bare bones. They're the physical transport. If you want to put in nitrogen fixation, which you're welcome to do, um, it's got to be in addition, right? And same with any kind of uh, biological dumbwaiter mechanism of carrying nutrients up and down by zooplankton, right? And the fluxes have to occur in red field ratios or approximately red field ratios. And the other thing which is key to this is that if you do your sums, one year's supply of, of nutrients from this flux gauge estimate has, actually indicates that you require the, the entire upper 300 meters of inventory of, of nutrients, at least near Bermuda. Now what I mean by that is if you took integrated helium-3 curve or nitrogen or phosphorus, you find that you'd have to take all of this to get it up for one year's supply, okay? In reality, it doesn't disappear every winter or every summer. So in fact, you're probably mining from deeper in the summer climate. So it's, it's worse than that, okay? Now, if you simply take this gradient and say, okay, I've got a gradient, I've got a flux, let's use fixed law. What kind of mixing rate do we have? What's the vertical mixing rate? 10 to the minus three meters squared per second. At which point now I've annoyed the physicists, okay? Because this is completely unphysical. Typical measurements for tracer release experiments are 10 to the minus five, all right? Now maybe up near the surface you can get away with maybe 10 to the minus four, but not in the right social circles. Um, but in any case, this is pretty big, okay? Now, I don't think there's any problem with this because the reality is that, in fact, our kind of concept model of this mass distribution is based on pretty fuzzy large-scale processes. And if you look at the sort of recent very, very high-resolution experiments, for instance, Mahadevan and Archer and, and Marina Levy's work, um, you find there's a palpable change in, in the circulation and, and mass transport associated with these very highly resolved numerical models. So I don't think that's really such a big deal, although I'd like to make some mileage on that and annoy some of the modelists for now. Um, there is another issue, though, and that issue, by the way, is it's red fuel water down there, okay? And what I mean by that is if you picture a parcel of water which comes up to the surface with the nutrients that you need to support the production, which we've measured the flux thereof, it's actually going to come up with an oxygen debt which is exactly the right number or close to the right number and an excess CO2 surplus so that in fact it's going to cancel any gains you make in photosynthesis in the upper ocean. So we shouldn't see this, all right? But we do. Now, you're right, okay. Now we could have a change in C to N ratio in this and, and people know that in extreme oligotrophy you actually have high carbon to nitrogen ratios in this exported material. But there's two reasons why I don't think that's going to save us in some sense. First of all, if PQ, the ratio of carbon to nitrogen in this case, I'm being loose with terminology, is about twice that of the remineralization ratio, then the, the euphotic sound signal should be half of what we see. No, not what we see, not one times what we see, which is what we're seeing, if you see what I mean. Um, or if it's, if it's, you know, 10% different, it's got to be 10 times or one-tenth of what we see. So there's, there's some problem here. I mean, there's a quantitation issue. Um, the other one is that 
you can't get away with that forever because if you export carbon rich material, nitrogen poor material to the layers below, next year you're going to have to work awfully hard to get that much more nitrogen back up. So I, I would argue that in some sense variation of C to N ratios in the export of material is only a short term solution. It doesn't get you the answer in the end. Okay. So it's Redfield water down there and we've got this problem. How do we get around it? Well, a slippery geochemist might do the following. Uh, let's bring the water up, get rid of the oxygen debt, blow off the excess CO2 and then use the nutrients, right? Well, I'm afraid that doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work is because the surface relaxation times are in the opposite direction. Nutrients are taken up in a matter of days. Gas is transferred in a matter of months and uh, CO2 is transferred on time scales of a year almost. So they're all in the wrong direction. So there's no out clause in terms of trying to sneak the system in some sense. So here's, here's the paradox as I see it. How do we physically transport the nutrients to the euphotic zone without transporting negative heat, the oxygen debt, and the excess CO2 so that we don't mess up our other budgets and in sufficient quantity support the new production and see what we see in the euphotic zone signals in oligotrophic systems. Now why should you care? Why is it important? Well, first of all, oligotrophic oceans constitute 90% of the surface area of the oceans. Uh, they probably export at least half of the export production for the world oceans. And they, this kind of process of aphotic zone remineralization, nutrient reflux of the aphotic zone, occurs on sort of annual to century timescales. And these are the timescales that are so important from the viewpoint of modeling climate change in the ocean. All right? So my argument in some sense is there's still major problems with our understanding of the oligotrophic carbon cycle. I don't think we have all the answers yet. There's some real things. Unless you have an explanation, I'd be delighted for somebody to stand up. Embarrassed but delighted because I think I've given it a fair shot to try to understand this. That, that we don't understand the magnitude of the nutrient fluxes. I think there are proposed mechanisms, but I don't think they've been demonstrated yet to be viable in terms of the stoichiometry of the system and, and how things are moving around. And that's a detail that I can't get into. And how do we explain the decoupling of the elemental cycles that we're seeing in the upper ocean in precisely the, the way that we're seeing them? And this paradox implies there are problems with integrating physical processes because it's going to be a physical mechanism, I think that's going to be fluxing these nutrients. That's why the, the helium-3 uh, flux gauge sees these things. And so it sounds to me like we don't have the physics right either. We haven't parameterized those subgrid scale processes. I think we need to turn to these very high resolution simulations to find out exactly how we're going to do this process. I, I, I think we've got to move beyond the, the current parameterization of the system and then extend them for the global scale models because I think until we do that, you know, we're not going to have confidence in the competence of these models to predict, for example, global, uh, global carbon fixation rates in the face of climate change, um, changes in the, in the biogeochemical state as a result of the changes in elemental cycles that we've imposed on the system. So I think this is really an important issue and I think I'd be delighted if anybody could uh, give me the answer. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Bill. We have time for a few questions. Uh, actually, no. Um, the question is whether um, a deep winter mixed layer coupled with stratification and trapping of material could do it. Um, I think part of the answer may be in noceums in terms of or organic uh, nutrient pools or something like that. I, I don't know. Um, but in terms of the, the deep mixed layer, the mixed layers are simply not deep enough to harvest that amount of material. Um, at Bermuda. In principle, the northern Sargasso Sea, this is true, but what we're seeing is this, this uh, helium-3 flux locally 
Bill, I have a, I have a question. Uh, oh. You showed the one slide where you had a factor of a hundred discrepancy between what uh, our current thinking is about dipycnal mixing and versus what the what the tracers were telling us. Is, is it is it the possible that the physical sort of diagnostic model you were using for the interpretation of that could be missing some other processes that might be wrapped up in that factor of 100 lateral advection or well, absolutely I think you know clearly there's uh, well there's two things one of them is that isopignic transport will be far less you know uh, capable of transporting heat through the system so that's one partial out uh, the second issue is that, of course, is these eddy processes, uh, the eddy heaving mechanisms that McGillicuddy has talked about, um, which suggests that uh, there may be some process there. But th those are highly idealized, and I think I'm still waiting to see whether they will actually do the right things as far as the traces are concerned. There's another one which is kind of at the back of my mind, is that in some sense we have this sort of Reynolds concept of, of uh, Reynolds decomposition concept for eddy fluxes. Um, what happens when the, the time scales of the processes whereby you have biological uptake and removal um, and production is, is actually much shorter than your sort of your uh, integration time scales would suggest that in fact the Reynolds decomposition model may have to be revised in that respect. That's another possibility. Additional questions? Well, if not, let's give our speaker uh, one more round of applause for a very excellent presentation.